kiddos, we're back and we're continuing our discussion on phase diagrams. In the last video, we talked about the phase diagram of carbon dioxide and water. Today, we're going to construct our own phase diagram and we're going to do that for the compound ammonia. Now, for that, we need some data. And um, I have the triple point, uh, the triple point pressure and the triple point temperature. Remember, that's the temperature and pressure when all three phases solid, liquid, and gas, are in equilibrium with each other. I have my critical point, which is my critical temperature and my critical pressure. Remember, the critical temperature is the temperature above which no amount of pressure will liquefy a gas, and the pressure needed to liquefy it at the critical temperature is the critical pressure. My normal boiling and normal freezing now, as soon as I use the word normal in this context, it tells us that I'm at one atmosphere of pressure, and I have both the normal boiling and freezing point temperatures. So, with that data in mind, let's go ahead and construct our phase diagram. We'll begin by drawing our y-axis, and of course our y-axis is pressure, and the unit we're using here is atmospheres, and our x-axis that is temperature, right? And that would be in degrees Celsius. So let's go ahead and start with our triple point. Now, remember these phase diagram graphs are not necessarily to scale, so keep that in mind. I'm going to call my uh, pressure, even though it's really, really close to zero, so we can see it, I'm going to call it this point on my y-axis, 0 0.060 atm, and we're going to make this temperature negative 77.7 degrees Celsius, and we'll put a dot right there. That is my triple point. Uh, my critical point, let's see, that's uh, 112 atmospheres, so we're going to break my graph right here. We're going to say, okay, that's 112 atms, and it looks like my critical temperature is 132 0.2 degrees Celsius. So we're going to break my graph up right here. We're going to call this 132.2 degrees Celsius. And we'll put a point right there. And that is my critical temperature. Now, that line is going to go vertical because no amount of pressure can liquefy the gas once I exceed that critical temperature. Now, remember, normal is one atmosphere. So I'm going to call one atmosphere on my graph. We're going to put that right there. And it looks like my normal boiling point is negative 33. So we're going to call this uh, right here on my graph negative 33.5 and one atmosphere. And we will put a point right there. We're going to call that T sub B. That's my normal boiling point. And we can now connect these dots. Okay. And so we have the gas phase over here. Somewhere, we're going to have the liquid and solid phase. Let's go ahead and plot my normal freezing point so we can determine where that is. Well, hey, the normal freezing point is the same as the, or the triple point temperature. So at one atmosphere, I'm going to put a point right here. And so the slope of that line is going to be zero. Isn't it just a nice vertical line? So this is my solid phase. This is my liquid phase, and we've already identified our gas phase. I'm just going to draw a ta tail arbitrarily uh, down here to the origin. Alrighty, so let's say I am at a particular temperature. I don't know. Let's say we're at room temperature and uh, one atmosphere of pressure. And room temperature is sort of hard to find on this graph, but I'm going to say it's, I don't know, right around here, we'll say is about 20 degrees Celsius and one atmosphere of pressure. That's going to put me right there. And so we can see that ammonia would be a gas at room temperature. What if I increase the pressure without changing the temperature? So if I increase the pressure, we could actually have liquid ammonia if the pressure uh, were able to get high enough. All right. Um, also, if we're able to decrease the temperature, um, Maintaining that same pressure, we can see that it could also liquefy. Alrighty, so there's your phase diagram for ammonia. And that's just a quick way to draw phase diagrams. Once again, the graphs don't need to be completely to scale. Um, we should be able to answer this question, though. Will the solid or liquid be denser? 
So let's see. Um, let's go below its freezing point. So let's say, I don't know, negative 80 Celsius, we'll say right here in one atmosphere. So there's my um, negative 80 in one atmosphere. You can see it's a solid. I'm below the freezing point at one atmosphere. If I increase the pressure, it stays the solid, doesn't it? Yeah. Unlike water, if you remember, the slope of the solid liquid line was negative. And so when I increase the pressure, it melted. But you can see with ammonia, it does not do that. So if I have NH3 solid to NH3 liquid, which of these would be denser? Well, while I increase the pressure, it stays the solid. So the solid must have the smaller volume than the liquid. Once again, because when I increase the pressure, it's going to go to the smaller volume, which must be the solid, because I'm staying in the solid region. So the, so the smaller volume for the same mass would mean that the solid has the greater density. So solid ammonia uh, would sink in liquid ammonia. Okay? All right. Now, there goes phase diagrams. And now I want to talk about change of state. So we're going to change gears a little bit. And we're going to talk about heat required to change phases. And so two definitions here, heat of fusion and heat of vaporization. And in chemistry, a lot of the times we call heat enthalpy. So when I say enthalpy of fusion, it's synonymous with heat of fusion. And the same is true with enthalpy of vaporization. The definition for the heat of fusion is the quantity of energy required to melt a substance at its melting point. So we're not changing the temperature, we're just breaking the intermolecular forces in that crystalline structure and causing them to be able to slide past one another. So the quantity of energy required, so it's an endothermic process, to melt a substance at its melting point. So if I have a sample of ice and I start warming it up, um, that temperature will increase if it's below its freezing point until it gets to its freezing point. And then when I get to the freezing point, so here's my ice. It looks like I'm starting at negative 25. I get to my freezing point at zero. Even though I'm adding heat, the temperature doesn't change. So that heat that I'm adding between points B and C, or line segment B and C, would be my delta H of fusion, the energy required to melt my ice or my substance at its melting point. And notice there's no delta T. The temperature remains constant. Until I reach point C, what's happened there? Yeah, all of the ice is now turned into liquid water. And then when I add more energy, the temperature starts to rise again. Okay, so that's heat of fusion, the energy required to melt the substance at its melting point. A couple of key words, energy required. It's an endothermic process to melt the substance. And we're not changing the temperature, we're at the melting point. Well, what do you think heat of vaporization is? Yeah, if you said the quantity of heat or the quantity of energy required to boil a substance, that means we're changing it from its liquid to its vapor stage or phase at its boiling point. So once again, it's endothermic, it's energy required, and we're going to go ahead and break the intermolecular forces and separate those particles by great distances from one another at the boiling point. So that requires energy, as you can imagine. So let's take a look at my graph here again. Uh, once I've achieved my liquid phase and I'm starting to add more heat, the temperature goes up, 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 up. And for water, once it reaches 100 degrees Celsius at standard pressure, the water begins to boil. That's where the vapor pressure of the liquid is equal to the atmospheric pressure. And we start to break hydrogen bonds between the water molecules. 
and the temperature does not change. The temperature staying at 100 degrees Celsius as that water is boiling. So this energy right here between points D and E is called my heat of vaporization. So the energy I have to add to cause all of that water to boil at its boiling point is called the heat of vaporization. Now what's happened when I got to point B? Well, yeah, the temperature starts to go up again, doesn't it? And that's because the phase change is complete. So to go through a phase change, energy is required. Um, well, so when the substance is at its melting or boiling points, adding more heat doesn't change the temperature of the substance until all of it has either melted or boiled. Then the temperature will rise. Here, let me give you a, a quick example. Uh, let's say it's a really hot day and you are at your swimming pool. Okay, uh, put some swim trunks on you. There you go. All right, and there's a pool over here. And man, you are hot. And so what do you do? Well, you jump in that pool, don't you? And you cool off. Now, it might be 100 degrees uh, Fahrenheit outside, so nice and toasty outside. When you get out of that pool and you're standing um, on the side of that pool, dripping with water, what do you start to do? Yeah, even though it's really warm outside, 100 degrees Fahrenheit, you start to shiver. Hmm. Well, wait a minute, it's 100 degrees outside. Why are you shivering now? See, over here, you were really, really hot. You couldn't wait to get in the pool. Now that you've gotten out of the pool, you are shivering. Yeah, we're taking water from its liquid phase, and on the surface of your body, water is going to the gas phase. Heat is required to do that. That's called the heat of vaporization, isn't it? Going from a liquid to a gas. Well, where does that heat come from to turn that liquid to a gas? Well, yeah, it has to come from the surroundings. And what are the surroundings? That's right, it's your body. So your body is losing heat for this phase change to occur. When your body loses heat, of course, it feels cold. You begin to shiver. Of course, when do you stop shivering? Well, yeah, either when you towel off or when all the water is evaporated because, well, there's no more water to evaporate and that energy to required to evaporate the water is not needed anymore because the water is not there. Now, if you think about it, the same thing happens when you perspire. If you think about it, why do you perspire? Absolutely, you perspire so you can cool down. And so that liquid on the surface of your body, mostly water, evaporates and it takes energy from your body away with it, effectively cooling you down. Now, I have a quick demo I want to show you at the end of this video. I will boil water at room temperature. So you'll notice the Bunsen burner's on, and I'm sorry, I'm not boiling water at room temperature. I'm boiling water in a paper cup. That's what I meant to say. So you'll notice that I have a paper cup full of water, and there's a Bunsen burner right underneath that paper cup, and it's on full blast. And you'll notice the paper cup doesn't burn, yet the water inside the cup is boiling. And you should be able to tell me why the cup doesn't burn. It has something to do with this heat of vaporization. So enjoy that video, and that's it for today. Bye-bye. Um, you can see that the heat being added is going in to boil the water. And you can see the water is boiling quite vigorously now, spilling over the sides with the cup. The cup's not burning at all. All that heat going into the water is changing its phase, not raising its temperature.